Praise the Lord. Turn to Mark chapter 11. We're going to have the communion tonight, and as usual, I like to bring something along the line of faith and healing. And I'm going to be dealing with the subject, man's word or God's word. Which should we believe? Man's word or God's word? Well, in Mark 11:22, he says to have faith in God for whosoever... Your whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast in the sea, and not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you that what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall have In the presence of so many conflicting opinions among charismatics as to how much of the Word of God we can take literally today, a question which, by the way, I thought was settled when you got saved. (laughs) But in the face of so much confusion, so many conflicting opinions about how much you can believe and how much is to be taken literally, it comes as a breath of fresh air to hear Jesus say what he says here, that what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you'll have them. That doesn't need any interpretation. So it's refreshing to hear him say such things, like in Matthew twenty-one, twenty-two: all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. All things, not some things. If you ask anything according to my will, he says, I hear you. And if I hear you, you already have your petition. Now, what's so hard about that? That's clear enough. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. Now, he didn't always say to raise him up an hour after you pray, but he says the Lord will raise him up. So whatever men may say to the contrary, however much they may tend to obscure the clear meaning of these promises with their own doubts and fears and unbelief, the promises are clear enough. I mean, look at it this way. If those promises are not clear, then how would you ever know? If you don't understand just those few we quoted, how would you ever know what Jesus really meant by anything he said? If when he says all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive, if you can't understand that, how could you understand John 3.16? How would you know he really meant what he said when he said that? But he says we can know, we can understand. He tells us in John 7.17, that if we will do his will, we'll know of the teaching, whether it's from God or man. He tells us in 1 John 2.20 that we have an anointing, that is, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and therefore, he says, you can know all things. He tells us in Hebrews 5 that we should grow to the place in the Word that we can communicate it to others, that it ought to be clear enough to us that we can tell others. In fact, Paul rebukes the Christians there because they've been sitting under the Word long enough that they themselves should be teachers of these truths, and they're not doing it. The Bible rebukes us if we do not know what God has said. The Bible says we can know, we can understand, we can appropriate all the promises of God. I mean, do you need healing? Then there's a promise in the Word. Will God feed and clothe you? Will He protect and deliver you from Satan and the powers of darkness? Will He solve your financial problems? Will He save your loved ones? Will He reveal His will for your life? The the only question is, can you read? (laughs) All of those questions are answered right here in the Word, clearly answered. The only question is, not will God do these things, the only question is, are you able to read? Because if you're able to read and don't see the answer and don't already know the answer, then either you can't read or you've missed the plain meaning of the word when he said, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you receive, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you have them, you'll have them. The scriptures also tell us that the God who makes those promises can't lie. God cannot lie. So who then are we going to believe? God who cannot lie or men who say and who are constantly teaching in the churches and the colleges and the seminaries and charismatic groups, who are we going to believe? God who cannot lie or men who are saying that God didn't mean what he said or didn't say what he meant? Because that's, in essence, what they're telling us. God said in James 5, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And you won't have to travel very far in charismatic circles that you'll hear them teaching. Now, what God meant by that was, to pray, if it be thy will, heal the sick through the doctors and the medicines. That's exactly what they teach. And yet, 
The promise is clear enough. And then they say, this is what he meant. Did it ever strike you as strange that a God who is wise enough, powerful enough to create a universe out of nothing could seldom ever say what he meant? (laughs) Everything I read, tapes I listen to, books I read, are always reinterpreting the clear promises. You know, well, don't be presumptuous about this faith. Did it ever occur to you Or did it ever seem strange to you that a God who could do all that he's done could never say what he meant and had to send men to the seminary to try to find out what he really meant so they could go out and teach the people? Now, here's what God meant by what he said. (laughs) Did it ever occur to you that the early church, without the seminaries and the Bible schools and without the intellectual religious leaders in their ignorance, just said, well, that's what he said and that's clear enough and they believed it and received it? See, without the... Instructions as to what it meant, why they just chose to believe it. So here in Mark eleven twenty two, he says, if you'll have faith in God, by the way, he is illustrating uh, from what he just did. He just cursed a fig tree and then he used that to draw a lesson or an illustration. Then he said, when Peter said that was so soon withered, withered he said, well, you have faith in God. So the question is not, what will God do, or or, are his promises clear enough that we don't need an interpretation, or are they so obscure that we need someone to interpret them for us? The answer to the problem isn't there. The problem is with Christians who are afraid to pay the cost of saying, I believe what he said, because the promises are clear enough, because they know if they say they believe them, they're going to have to act on them, they're going to have to practice them. Now, the promises are clear. There's no problem there. I haven't found a Christian yet that has any trouble reading the instructions on his medicine bottle. Take two every three hours, shake well before using. They never ask you, what does that mean? They're always wanting to know a clear promise that they don't want to obey. They say, now, what does that mean? Or how can I apply this? Or does God really mean what he says? Marriage and remarriage and divorce and healing and finances and... Well, everything up or down, any way you go. They're always asking questions, and yet I haven't found anyone that has any difficulty reading instructions on a box of crackers on how to open it, you know, when they're hungry. The point is, why do they have difficulty with the clear instructions in the words, what I'm getting at? I get calls, many calls from people who say they believe the faith message until they're going through a trial. You know, at home, marital trial or a physical trial or the money hasn't come, the deadline's passed and they're threatened with bankruptcy or they're going to lose the car or their home or they've got a friend that's dying of some incurable illness and they want to know what to do or what the Bible says. And they had no trouble, you know, until they started going through a trial. Those promises were clear enough. They quote them. They confess them. But when they go through a trial, they want you to reinterpret that for them. And yet I've never been awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning by anyone who wants to know what John 3.16 means. I mean, if that's clear, then what is obscure or difficult about Mark 11.24? What thing soever you desire, when you pray, at that moment believe you have received and you shall have it. Now you take all of the word. If you ask anything according to my will, then you have your petition. So you have to ask that desire according to his will. But this is where we get into the word. We learn what his will is. But I've never had anyone call me up to find out if 1 Corinthians 15 is really going to happen, that God will resurrect the dead at the day of judgment. So then why do they want answers to clear promises in the Word? Or why do they raise questions about it? See, God is displeased if you don't know His Word sufficiently to know what He sent to Christ to the cross to provide for you. See, He's displeased because then you don't appropriate it And then he can't fulfill his will in and through your life. He's frustrated because people don't know his word, so they're not believing the word. They're they're just sitting as spectators. But he's also displeased with those of you, if there happen to be any here, and there will be somewhere where the tapes go at least. He's also displeased if you know what he sent Christ to the cross to provide for you, but you choose to remain a faith baby. You see that you don't want to mature because the purpose of God in teaching you the fundamentals of faith is so that you can grow to a realm of faith where Jesus walked. Grow into a deeper life of faith. There's a deeper life in the Spirit, but there's a deeper life in faith. Now, some people, some some, uh, weak charismatics, some faithless charismatics, criticize us because of our stress on faith here, which is really the message God has given to help build 
and prepare the body of Christ for his soon appearance. They criticize us for our end-time message of faith. They criticize us because we're willing to trust God more than the doctors and the hospitals and the Blue Cross and the police and the Air Force and the Army and the Navy (laughs) and burglar alarms and watchdogs. Uh, But they haven't heard the half of it. (laughs) No, they criticize us because we trust God instead of the arm of the flesh. But God, they haven't heard the half of it. God's displeased with us if we stop with just that. And do not mature to the place where Jesus walked in the realm of faith. God expects you, I mean he expects you to walk where Jesus walked. And sometimes that's on water. If he's displeased with us, if we stop with the fundamentals of faith, then what does that say of the critics of faith? I'd I'd hate to be in their shoes when they face Jesus one day because he is displeased with us. And you can find that all through the Bible unless we press on into deeper realms of faith. He rebuked Peter in Matthew 14 because he could not walk on the water the first attempt as good as Jesus did. Oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? (laughs) First attempt. He rebuked his disciples for awakening him out out of a sound sleep because the boat was sinking. At least they thought it was and said, where's your faith? He rebuked his disciples because they couldn't cast out a strong demon and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? He goes through the New Testament rebuking his disciples when they show a lack of faith. And you see it in the Old Testament. God was sorely displeased with Moses because he was afraid to go face the most powerful leader in the world and demand that he release all of his slaves. <laughs> he was displeased, so displeased with Israel, he let them perish in the wilderness because they were afraid of those giants in whose sight they appeared as grasshoppers. I mean, God's displeased when you face a giant or a pharaoh of this world in fear and tremble and don't use that word that he's given you and overcome What do you think all that's in the Word for? Paul tells us twice in the New Testament that all of these things have been recorded that happened to Israel, that happened in the history of the human race for our admonition. The Bible is filled with examples where God is displeased. He commends faith when it's there, but he's displeased with anybody who fails to believe him or questions a promise in his Word. In fact, he's displeased with you if you don't believe for the impossible. Amen. The impossible. Now, as we saw this morning, Jesus said the time's coming when we'll do not only his works, but greater works. Well, there's one thing for certain. The critics of faith will never do his works. In fact, I'm going to tell you something for those of you ready to receive it. He's going to take the anointing away from those who are not using their faith uh, in, in the promises of God, who have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's going to take the anointing away from people who are sitting on the fence or who are opposing the message of faith. And that time is soon going to come where those people are just going to go down, 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 and backward, backward. I'm not talking about getting lost. They can still speak in tongues and attend charismatic meetings. I'm talking about the anointing that God has placed within us is the same anointing that was on Elijah and Elisha, and he expects us to expect him to do the impossible as we use that faith. So he doesn't want you sitting on the fence. He doesn't want you wavering back and forth between doubt and faith. Those of us who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's expecting us to go on to deeper things in faith. So how long will you sit on the fence if you're there? Back and forth between faith and doubt. Who are you going to believe? A mere man who, because he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, thinks he's an infallible interpreter of the Word of God and says, now this is what God really meant, or the Holy Spirit who inspired that Word himself. The Word is clear. Are you going to believe a man who thinks he's infallible, an infallible interpreter of God's truth, or the Spirit who gives the truth? Jesus said, when the Spirit has come, he's going to teach you all things, he's going to guide you into all truth. So the time has come when charismatics must stop listening to men when they teach things clearly opposite to what God himself has said. You don't need someone to come along and and tell you 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 shouldn't follow that teaching or that person or that uh, doctrine. If it's out of harmony with the Word of God, you should stop listening to that. You should stop following that that teaching. If the Word of God says, as it does in James 5, the prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise him up, then why would you listen to a person? As most charismatics now are following this sort of teaching, why would you listen to someone who says, when James 5 tells you the prayer of faith heals the sick, they say, well, now what that means is you should pray while you take your medicine. Pray the prayer of faith while you have your surgery. Well, yes, don't do anything foolish, we're told. Psalm 91 promises protection and deliverance, but don't do anything foolish. Yes, we know Jesus is a rock, but so is Prudential. (laughs) 
Oh, they think you've lost your mind if you don't have insurance. The Prudential Rock. And uh, they know that the, about the old rugged cross, but they think you're foolish if you don't have blue cross. And uh, faith is a shield, but there is blue shield. Well, God is expecting us to come to the place in this hour where we are foolish even to the rest of charismatics. I don't, I don't relish having to say that, but it's true nevertheless that you're just going to have to be different because God is looking for people who are willing to be different. If you want God to heal you, you're going to have to meet the conditions. You're going to have to be different. You're going to have to go all the way with God. If you want God to bless you, if you want him to use you in this end time, you're going to have to be different. You're not going to be the average charismatic. You're going to have to be the person that says, if God said it, then I'm going to believe it. I'm going to go back to first century Christianity, or I'm even, it's all right to say I'm going to go back to early Pentecost at the turn of the century when those Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and whatever who wanted more of God just began to seek God until he poured out his spirit and then they went out and did all the miracles you read about in the book of Acts and did it for years. Did it until the second and third generation of Pentecostals came along. Then when he poured his spirit out upon the denominational people, they began to believe God for the impossible and you began to see tremendous things happen. You had great ministries like Oral Roberts and William Branham and T.L. Osborne and Catherine Kuhlman and Jack Coe and uh, W.V. Grant and a lot of people we can mention, but, but that's all kind of going off the scene now, you see. And uh, charismatics are just kind of resting on their leaves, you know, just sitting down, waiting to die to go up through a hole in the sky, I guess. Uh, not believing for anything. Not expecting anything to happen. And couldn't care less, some of them, to find out what God's purpose is for this end time. There are four or five classes of people that God cannot heal. It all has to do with whether you're going to believe God's word or man's word. Now, let me give you those tonight before we have the communion. There are certain people God cannot heal. Now, nothing's impossible with God, but there are conditions that he sets forth in his word. And you're going to have to be willing to believe the word of God rather than the word of man. Even though everyone else is saying one thing, if God's word says you must do this, you must believe that, then you're going to have to stay with that. Now, when I was up in Baltimore several years ago, I was sitting waiting to go on, that is to speak. And as I sat there, the God began to speak to me and uh, spoke to my heart. And he said that I want you to tell the people, and I've been telling the people since then, everywhere we go, every time I think of it at least, Tell the people they don't believe my word if they won't confess my word and won't act on it. So God cannot heal those whose confession or actions are contrary to his word. Tell the people that a person who does not act on my word does not believe my word. It doesn't matter what he says. A person who will not confess and act on the word doesn't believe the word. And we've got people saying, well, after they're prayed for, well, I'll wait to see how I feel in a few days and then I'll testify. Uh, some people actually, I know of people who actually will go to the doctor and have an x-ray. Say, oh, I know I'm healed, but I just want to have this testimony so that when I stand up, I'll have medical evidence. Some people actually accept surgery or submit to surgery to find out if they're healed. So the Lord is not going to heal people that do not confess and act in harmony with his word. And another class of people that God cannot heal are those that are not sure they want to be healed. Now, that may sound a little strange. We deal with this in our book, Angels of Light. A little strange to find people who will get in a prayer line or ask you to come to pray for them uh, and yet do not really want to be healed. But there's some people who do not uh, for various reasons. One, one uh, of the most common reasons is they have feelings of inadequacy and insecurity. And uh, this way they don't have to face reality. Uh, they can always, you know, well, I can't do this or hold a job or something because I'm sick or I don't this or that or the other. And some use sickness or infirmity to manipulate and control their loved ones, a husband or a wife or a family. Yeah, they use that. And so we go into this in the book Angels of Light. Uh, it has to do there with deliverance, but it's the same idea. There's some people that can't get delivered. Now, I've met some of these. At first, you see, when you first began charismatic ministry, when you first began ministering to people, it's hard to believe that a person would run all over the country trying to get delivered or healed, but really doesn't want it. And the Lord uh, allowed us to have experiences like this early in our faith walk and faith ministry and deliverance ministry from the occult. 
In fact, he sent us one individual that it took us, I don't know, two or three months to discover that actually this person didn't want deliverance. What she wanted was attention. And it was a feeling, again, of insecurity and so forth and so on. And if you get delivered, and uh, when I discovered this, I tried to help her, but she wouldn't have any of it. But they feel if they get delivered, they'll lose that attention they need to exist. That may sound a little strange and morbid, but there can be people sitting here tonight that are not healed or something hasn't happened that you say you're believing for, you're confessing, or you want, or you have testified to, because uh, if it really happens, then what are you going to do with it? Or then what will happen? Oh, Lord, give me this or that ministry, and then uh, you, you wouldn't know what to do with it if you got it. So you just kind of hold it out there and hope that you get it and don't get it at the same time. So God, God can't, can't use a person. Well, it's like the person, you know, well, I want a word ministry, and he just gets all ready to go, but uh, he wouldn't, he'd be afraid to get up and speak if God, you know, opened the door. And so there is that sort of thing in, in a lot of people. Psychologists have a name for it. I won't burden you with it, but God cannot help people who are not sure they want help. And then he can't help or heal people who won't give up the cause of their illness. Now, tonight, as we partake of the communion, there is, there is healing in the atonement. And you release your faith as we partake of the communion because that is provided for you, both physical and spiritual, mental healing. But God cannot heal a person that doesn't give up the cause of the illness. Now, there's some people who would like to be delivered. Like I know one case where the individual wanted to be delivered but didn't want to give up the cause of the problem. And that's what we're talking about here. In another instance, I remember, by the way, James 5 says that we are to confess our faults. You know, the prayer of faith will heal the sick, but one of the conditions is confessing. In Mark 11, verses 25 and 26, if we had gone on to read that, he said, you know, that you can have whatever you pray for in faith, but he said, if you have aught against your brother, you are to forgive him, because then obviously you can't release faith, or you couldn't pray the prayer of faith. So with that in mind, uh, I was asked to go to the hospital to uh, pray for a certain individual. Would I go? I, would I go with this person? I said yes. And uh, they had a real burden for this man because they had known him for some years. And he had uh, his building, his apartment had caught on fire and he jumped out of his window, jumped out of his window and broken his leg and it wouldn't heal. And she said he's unsaved, but uh, she believes, you know, if I would go and talk to him, that uh, the Lord could save him and heal him. And, of course, I knew that the healing would depend on the salvation. While he wanted his healing, he just had to lay there because the leg wouldn't heal. But while he wanted his healing, he didn't want to surrender the kind of life he was living, which was pretty sinful, if I told you what it was. Because he wanted to hold on to the sins, but he wanted his healing too. And so I just told him, I said, until you give your life to Christ first and give up that sordid life you're living, he can't heal you. He won't heal you. I said, he will heal you. I'll guarantee you on the authority of his word, if you will meet the conditions. But he wouldn't. And so I didn't pray for him. There's no way. I don't know. Maybe some people would pray for a person like that. But God isn't going to heal a person that is uh, in rebellion and living in sin. So God cannot heal you if there's something there, resentment or bitterness or sin or disobedience or uh, lack of uh, full consecration, whatever it is that uh, is not right in your life, God's not going to heal you till you make it right. Then God does not heal those who will not accept their healing when they pray. Now that may sound strange, but there are a lot of people you see that if they don't feel healed right away, don't believe they're healed. And you've got to learn to accept your healing when you pray. God cannot heal a person who will not accept the answer when they pray because Mark 11:24 says, When you pray for your healing in this case, believe you have been healed and you shall have it. That simply means that God hasn't promised to start the process of healing in your body a moment sooner than you believe that he has started when you pray. He doesn't start it till you believe it. He doesn't start it because you pray. He doesn't start it because you say, I believe Mark 11:24. He doesn't start the process of healing because you say, I believe that I have received. He starts the process of healing the moment you accept your healing. It's done. I don't have to pray again. I don't have to feel around, go check, look in the mirror. It's done. 
I remember a woman up in the east that wrote us a letter after we were up there speaking and said that she had been healed of everything that she had ever asked God to heal her of, you know, when she got sick. But she said for years, in fact, went back to childhood, there was a certain condition that she had, an infirmity. She said, I have done the same praying, the same believing, the same everything, but she says, I have not been able to get a healing of that. She said, I don't know why it persists and persists and persists. And she said that... She got our tape, which stressed this verse, Mark eleven twenty four, to believe you have received when you pray. She said after listening to that a few times, it finally, God finally showed her what she was doing wrong, where she was missing it. She said each time for that condition that I would claim my healing, I would wait, you know, a few days or weeks or whatever, expecting a change to come, and it never would. And she said, what I was doing, I was not accepting the work is done. I was waiting for some outward evidence that I was healed. And she said, I finally saw it. You know how many people they can sit and listen to messages and be charismatic for years and still not see the simplest thing in the Bible, which is Mark 11, 24. You know how many people they can sit and listen to messages and be charismatic for years and still not see the simplest thing in the Bible, which is Mark 11, 24. That if you believe you have received when you pray, then that settles it. You don't even talk about it except to testify it's done and that it shall be manifested. And she said, I finally saw it. I had never settled the matter. I just kept praying about it periodically. After listening to the tape, I prayed once more. She said, this time in faith, I accepted my healing. She said, in two days. Had this since childhood. In two days, she said, it was totally manifested. (laughs) See, God cannot manifest till you accept. Because nothing's happened. What can he manifest when you haven't believed you're healed? And in another case, uh, in Louisville, where I was speaking, giving my testimony of faith, there was a woman who came after the message. She said, well, in effect, with faith like that, I'd like for you to pray for me. I have such and such a condition that just can't get it healed. I've been prayed for by Oral Roberts, William Branham, T.L. Osborne. She named everybody. And who was Hobart Freeman? But uh, she somehow, that faith message got through to her. I said, I'll be happy to pray for you on one condition. She said, what's that? I said, if you won't ask for prayer again for this condition, never again. Well, she said, why? Well, I said, somewhere you've got to stop asking and start receiving. Believing you have received. I said, you've never received your healing yet. I said, you should stand on Mark eleven twenty four, ask once, settle the matter, and you will receive. Well, she said uh, the last person named who it was, I've forgotten, it was probably T.L. Osborne, uh, said, I believed I was healed when he prayed. Why couldn't I just stand on that? I said, I would highly recommend it. (laughs) A few months later, I was back in Louisville speaking in a church, and the pastor invited us out for lunch, and of course, I didn't know she was a member of his church. Uh, She was at a full gospel meeting, and there she was sitting, a good friend of them. And, of course, I don't have to tell you, it had been totally manifested because she had accepted her healing. So God cannot heal those who want certain conditions met on their terms. And the fifth one is that God cannot heal those who want healing through the instrumentality of man. Oh, we're going to lose some charismatics there, won't we? Oh, they say, I believe God heals through the doctors and the hospitals, and we go through that route. Well... Uh, if that's the way, then why didn't he just say that in his word? Go to the doctor. If there's any sick among you, let him call for the doctors. <laughs> why didn't he go that route? People say, I believe God heals through the doctors and the medicines. Well, I just answer that and say, people generally go to the doctor they're living closest to. And if that's... <laughs> Amen. That's a fact. I mean, I think, I think that would settle every matter right there. Anyone who brings that up. What do you believe? And see, and they try to get you all wrapped up in what you believe about doctors and medicines. I've got good friends who are doctors and acquaintances, friends and acquaintances who are doctors and who are surgeons and who are dentists and dental surgeons and insurance men that come on stronger than I do, if that's possible. Amen. So I, I've got no quarrel there. But you see, that isn't, that's the devil trying to get you tied up in some vain arguments that'll prove nothing. And so just say, well, you will generally go to the doctor you're living closest to. And if you're living close to him, it's no trouble to call on him, like he says. But people are brainwashed. They're afraid to trust God. And they want to be, they want to rationalize this because charismatic leaders and teachers are doing it everywhere you go. You hear it. 
that, that God is healing through the instrumentality of man. Well, then, if he is, he was always doing that, and why put all of these promises of healing in the Bible? Why put the, the disease and the pain on Jesus? And so on and so forth. Why did he say call for the elders of the church? They had doctors back then, Dr. Luke and all of that. So it would have been very easy for God to have said what he meant if that's what he meant. So we're back to that. God, you know, they tell us God didn't mean what he said when he said what he meant. And so we need intellectual interpreters to tell us what he meant by what he said. He's wise enough to create a universe out of nothing, Hebrews 11.3. But apparently, according to some of the teachers, he has trouble telling us what he really meant. I remember up in Illinois, uh, I was speaking at a full gospel chapter there, praying for the sick and people to receive the Holy Spirit and so on, and a woman came in desperation because I suppose I, or whoever had been ministering, of course, had been the same, but I suppose I was her last uh, hope, uh, the prayer of faith. Such had a child that was dying of leukemia, that the doctors, no way to help him, absolutely helpless, hopeless, hopeless case. And would I agree with her? Because I'd been stressing, as I always do, Matthew eighteen nineteen, where two are agreed as touching anything they ask. It'd be done for them by their Father in heaven. Would I agree for the healing of the child? I said, I'd be glad to. I said, nothing is impossible with God. I said, I've seen God answer every conceivable kind of prayer on the basis of Matthew eighteen nineteen. And then I ask what I usually do. Do you believe that when we agree that the child is healed? And she looked at me almost as if I'd have slapped her in the face and said, well, now I believe God will heal him through the doctors. And the doctors already given him up. I mean, she's there because it's her last hope. And they're so brainwashed and so paralyzed with fear, even though the doctors say we can't help him, she is not ready to believe that God can do it without the medicines and the care of the doctors while he's dying with the medicines and the care of the doctors. Because to take him off, you see, takes faith. And Christians, charismatic Christians, so brainwashed by secular philosophy and intellect and the principle that seeing is believing, that they do not know that believing is seeing according to the word of God, and that you can have a thing before you see it and feel it. Amen. God cures leukemia like he does anything else if you're willing to believe. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and... Worship the Lord through the communion of the bread and cup. He said in chapter 10 and verse 16, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Hallelujah. Then in chapter 11, when he had given thanks, verse uh, 23, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the New Covenant, literally, in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now verse 29 is for all of us. But let a man examine himself, and then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many are, are asleep, are dead. If we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. And so the admonition is that we examine our hearts and lives and commit anything that is not right to the Lord before we partake of the cup. Father, as we prepare now to call to remembrance through the symbols of the bread which symbolizes the flesh of Jesus and the cup, his shed blood, we open our lives, our hearts bare to thee and ask you 
to cleanse and to remove anything that would be a hindrance to our fellowship with you and one another because you've said this is the communion of one bread and one cup in one body that we might have the knowledge that we are cleansed and forgiven we confess that we desire to have that cleansing now in our hearts in Jesus name Amen and amen. Why don't we just take a moment and keep our heads bowed and just let the Lord speak to our hearts and you speak to him. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. As uh, some of the men volunteered to pass the cup and the bread, just stay in the Spirit and no talking and a lot of looking around, but as the Spirit leads for you to share a song, why just lead out and we'll sing with you. Amen. Let's just remain in the Spirit about it. Would we ha- could we have several volunteers, please? About a half a dozen or so.
about as close as we're going to get to heavenly choir till we get there. I know that blesses the Lord. Hallelujah. No one can sing like spirit-filled Christians. Hallelujah. In the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the same account that Paul speaks of is taking place. When the hour was come, Jesus sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament, New Covenant in my blood which is shed for you. So he tells us as we eat the bread, we do this in remembrance of him. Hallelujah. Then he says that he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And as we drink the cup, then we are reminded that he poured out his life unto death for us. Amen. Would you stand, please? Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your manifest presence. blessing upon this body as we go forth tonight and tomorrow and the days ahead that you will complete your work in us, that Jesus died at Calvary to provide for us, that will not fail in a single thing that you purpose for us, will not let a single word that we hear from you drop to the ground, but that everything will be accomplished to your satisfaction. That we'll hear that day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, bless this people, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.